This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Love is a full body-based feeling that resonates in every cell of your body. When we feel securely and genuinely loved, we know deep in our bones that we have a home port in the heart of that one special person. Moreover, love is the earthiest of experiences. It's waking up at 3 a.m. and feeling the warmth of your beloved skin touching you as you drift back to dreamland. It's smelling the scent of their body and sensing the soothing familiarity of it all. Genuine, secure love is sharing a host of little moments with each other as you go through your day. It's that lingering hug and kiss as you leave for work. It's getting a quick text message with a simple, silly red heart that says, You matter so much to me. Love is seeing a smiling face or hearing a soothing voice as you walk through the door at the end of a hairy day that says, Welcome home, darling. It's stopping your life to listen when your beloved is overwhelmed or troubled. It's praising them for the smallest of achievements just because you take notice. Love is all of this, and much, much more. Valerie Atelis interviews Dr. Gary D. Salier, the author of Safe to Love Again, How to Release the Pain of Past Relationships and Create the Love You Deserve. Dr. Gary Salier is a transformational relationship mentor. For the last decade, Dr. Salier has been in private practice, offering singles and couples heart-centered transformation so they can rewrite the rules for love in their brains and create a love that lasts. Dr. Gary speaks to a national audience as a featured expert on various celebrity TV and radio shows, such as Hay House Radio and Coast to Coast AM. He is the author of the groundbreaking book, Safe to Love Again, How to Release the Pain of Past Relationships and Create the Love You Deserve. Meet Dr. Gary at GarySalier.com. Here is the interview with Dr. Gary D. Salier. In your own words, who is Dr. Gary Salier? You know, I think I'm a, I'm a pilgrim uh, of consciousness. I've never uh, thought about it this way, but I'm just about, you know, becoming the most loving version of myself and uh, love and becoming higher consciousness, they're pretty much the same thing for me. I love that answer. And with that in mind, what is love to you? Or what is the idea or the ideal conception or definition of love that most of us would agree with? Well, but, wow, there's a lot of different uh, definitions for love. But, you know, I think love is, you know, when we so value the essence of that other person that we get them and we and when we get them we know how to attune and we so value them we want to attune to them we want to make them feel worthy and nourished and we want to cherish and protect it it's about seeing and valuing and really getting the essence of another being and doing everything you can to empower them to be their best self, their best essence. When you talk about this way of loving the other, I'm wondering if that starts with us, with self-love or unconditional self-love. You know, one of the things that's really interesting about my own work, uh, Valeria, is uh, I, I do, I help people love themselves. But one of the things that's really, really important to know is that, you know, I don't think uh, self-love is the beginning, but if we concentrate on self-love, 
concentrating on self-love doesn't necessarily make us better at loving another human being because there's an act of selflessness in, in real love. Uh, so I, when I think of self-love, I think it's about restoring those feelings I talk about, I'm, I'm, you know, knowing that you have, I'm working and having a feeling I am welcome in this world. And I can welcome myself into this world. I I am worthy. I am, and it's good to be cherished. I have a right to be cherished, and to know you have a right to feel empowered. If you can feel welcomed and worthy and cherished and empowered, and you can do that for yourself, then you can do it for another person. But it doesn't always work that way because sometimes people work so much on themselves that they actually don't know what it's like to love another person. It, you can overdo it a little bit. That's an interesting perspective that self-love could become something else. I have heard selfishness. It's the danger of that, narcissism in all that. Yeah, I guess what I speak of is self-love in a sense of, um, of love. It's coming from love. It's not really something that is selfish. It cannot be because it's coming from love. It really resonates with me this idea that if we don't know how to treat ourselves, how to be kind and compassionate to ourselves, we cannot do that with others. It's not possible. No, I agree with that. And I was realizing if someone was listening, they could get the wrong idea. Well, you know, I hardly, what I really meant to say is I hardly ever tell somebody, love yourself. But, but if in, the, in working with them, uh, you know, they have signed up and they really restore these these feelings I talk about. If they really know they have a right to feel welcomed and worthy and cherished and empowered, you never have to tell those people, once you restore their feelings, to love themselves. The, the, the feelings, once we restore these feelings that maybe we didn't get as a child, maybe we felt unwelcomed or unworthy or disempowered. Once we know we have a right and we can feel them in the core of our being, you rarely have to tell someone to love themselves. I think that's my bigger point. Telling someone to love themselves without giving them the feelings is a little, you know, the cart before the horse. Um, and once people get these feelings, they automatically treat themselves better. They, they And then, you know, uh, and they know that they, they do things to, that, you know, kind of do themselves right, so to speak. Their internal dialogue is better. They don't, if a, a worthy person doesn't browbeat themselves, oh, I'm never enough, I've got to do this, you know. Empowered people, you know, don't feel like they have to lose themselves right. So I think when I talk about self-love, it really isn't. The, the, the bold decision to reclaim these feelings that make us all feel loved and to turn it not only inward, but outward towards other. And if we can do that, uh, then we can truly love ourselves. And you're right, though, you know, whenever we don't are whenever we can't love ourselves, whatever, if we sign up for a partner, uh, we won't be able to love the part in them that reminds us of ourselves. <laughs> Talk to me for a moment, Gary, about what we were laughing about and having fun about before the record, off record. Sense of humor. How important is that in relationships? Do you teach your clients to cultivate sense of humor? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I teach, <laughs> but I do think it's, oh, yeah. and I certainly wouldn't teach them my, my sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a good one, though. <laughs> yeah, you know, but, you know, what I can say about humor, we all need lightness. We, you know, and there's some studies to show that, you know, women will not mate with a man that they consider. They may have sex, but when they consider mating, we're like making babies, right? They won't, they, they won't, 70% of the time, they won't choose a man that they consider less intelligent, Right. And one of those hallmarks, one of the primary hallmarks of intelligence is humor. But, you know, humor is something you need to lighten up because life will have its moments. Uh, and you need to be able to lighten it up to get through it. I think I developed my own sense of humor because growing up in a house with a mentally uh, you know, ill mother, uh, I needed it to balance out heaviness. And yet on the other hand, 
you know, I also know that you have to watch humor. What I have told some some husbands who use it at the wrong time, you know, if she's spilling her guts about something and you're constantly trying to 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 do humor and it's a dodge around really feeling her feelings, yeah. that isn't going to fly. True. <laughs> that yeah right. <laughs> Yeah, that would be wisdom, right? Not using, not having wisdom, right? What do you think is the purpose of the human experience, Gary? So the human experience is to yeah. learn more and more uh, what, it, how to expand ourselves and to, I think it's to love. I think it's to get beyond ourselves. It is a matter of consciousness. I personally think, uh, Valeria, that we, that souls sign up for certain experiences to certain to have certain experiences and learn certain lessons. That's the way I look at it. I signed up for a certain experience. It's not an accident. I wrote a book called Safe to Love Again. So I signed up for a childhood where, you know, with a borderline mother, things weren't always so safe, right? But people pick a variety of those. And I think we come here to learn, to expand, uh, to become our, uh, our best consciousness. And I think love is as high a consciousness as we as we find in this universe. How did you come to these understandings, Gary? Spiritual understandings. You know, it's funny you ask that question. When I uh, I've developed it over years, you know, but I can still remember feeling surrounded by a presence from as early as five. I would have had no name for it. There's certainly not a religion. I just never. I can remember playing at five in a sunlit front room at my grandmother's house. My mother was not there, and I was drawing and art and talk, and I was drawing dinosaurs, and I did not feel alone, though my mother hardly had anything to do with me. I just felt there was, I had a connection to life, uh, and I didn't feel alone. Now, as I evolved through life, I, I think, you know, part of me had to learn a lot of lessons but I have learned over and over that um, there is a higher self. You can call it source. You can call it whatever name you want. That guides us, right? And uh, I have, and I have sensed in my own life uh, a huge leading along the way. Uh, serendipitous things that just happen to work out. People that just show up, um, even while I, I wrote the book. I would get downloads at three or four in the morning. Although one time I had like six in one night and I, I looked and I said, you know, maybe sleep isn't any good for you folk up there, but it's kind of useful down here. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I get yeah. to sleep tonight. But there's in a lot of ways things show up. And uh, for me, that's a, uh, a people. I feel like I'm surrounded by a cosmic we that whenever I need uh, someone, they show up. I mean, even... This experience right here, Valeria, is a matter. You are the universe reaching out to me to say, let's get your message out. You're part of the way I live in. Do you have any spiritual practices, Gary, daily spiritual practices? You know, it's interesting you ask that, Valeria. Uh, you know, in the mornings, I oh, there's a place in my carpet where I, uh, uh, when I get up in the mornings, sometimes I do breathing and meditation, right? But most days, uh, I bow to the universe and just for a minute or two say, you know, whatever I'm supposed to become, whatever I'm supposed to do, write, create, guide me. Guide me. And uh, I, that's how I wrote the book. Every Friday night for a year, uh, every weekend, I would just bow and, and to the universe and say, you know, whatever I know, guide me in terms of how I write this book. Uh, and... Uh, I do feel uh, like I was tremendously guided. Just ideas. Uh, sometimes, I remember one time writing a book, I couldn't figure out how to start this chapter to save my soul. And I said, well, I don't guess I don't have any idea. I'm just going to go over to Facebook and troll over there for a couple of minutes. And this meme come up uh, of a friend who said something. And from that meme, my mind went a couple of different places. I said, oh, my God, I know how to start it. Well, now, what's that coincidence? <laughs> that happened multiple occasions. Uh, so and when you ask for guidance, you get it. Sometimes you don't always like it, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Would you say that your life is being guided by the universe? 
Well, see, I believe in free will. I think there's times that, you know, I had to go, I took, you know, I think the universe can talk to us through a feather or a sledgehammer, and I definitely took the sledgehammer approach sometimes. You know, I, I took, you know, there was a part of me that that was afraid of truly looking. And I'll give you the example. I I remember, you know, after my first divorce, right, um, being so uh, bitter and upset about things. But when I started working with this therapist, I was afraid that there'd be any part, so much, that there'd be any part of me that was my mother showing up because I'd always said I would be the opposite, right? And that worked very, very well. That there were several occasions where I told her, I won't go there. I'm afraid to look at the Medusa within me. And after my second divorce, and a few more failed relationships that were really painful. I, I, in my own work, I work with a coach, the guy that uh, helped train me in NLP. And uh, this time I had learned that not looking had cost me dearly. And my first words to him, I said, there is a place within me that I've been afraid to look. And I want to look at the Medusa. Now, those were my words to myself. And all I found, now if you want to know what self-love really looks like, Valeria, there was no Medusa within me. There was just a scared seven-year-old boy trying to figure out how to manage and survive a violent borderline mother. No, no, no part of me was as ugly as a Medusa, just a scared little boy. I was shocked to find out how out of rapport I had been with that part of myself. And I think for all of us, you know, that sort of self-judgment and the metaphors we use for our, our inner, you know, it was just a scared little boy. Yeah. That's all. It has been said that love is the opposite of fear. Do you believe that? Oh, I think in many, many respects, uh, it is very hard to do love and fear at the same time. So why the title of the book is called Safe to Love Again. It's not guilt tripped. It's not inspired. It's safe. Right. And uh, because, you know, you know, there's an old there's a scripture that says perfect love cast out all fear. Right. But what is but what is not so often said is that fear will cast out perfect love as well. When you look at couples fighting malaria. It is usually two people who have made it so unsafe for each other in one way or another, whether the person projects or they're prodding each other, and there's usually a little bit of both from some past pain, that they curl up within themselves as protection. And when you are curled up within yourself to build that wall, protection is rarely connection. And so fear is 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 not a good place for a couple you you know they really do have to make it safe for each other and they have to provide you know what i talk about when i talk about the feeling in the book of cherished and protected as being a main driver for love you know i mean what i really mean is that we know that that other person is going to give us a safe harbor for the ship of our life that we have a home port in their heart, that when the storms blow, we go into the harbor so we're not out there being buffeted by the waves, and we know it's safe to be in there. You know, if we're afraid to go in the harbor in the middle of a, you know, 90-mile-an-hour gale, yeah. that's a problem. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. That's a problem. True, yeah. so true. Yeah. I have a lot of questions about your book. Let me ask you one more warm-up question, uh, the last one, Gary. What is the meaning of freedom to you? What is to be free from your perspective? Boy, there's, boy, there's, you could write a whole book on that. Oh, but yeah. I think, <laughs> right. uh, you know, freedom is, uh, you know, it comes from a place, uh, the word, there's a Greek word for freedom, which means without bonds, uh, a wide, spacious place. And so freedom is the ability to expand ourselves, not in a grandiose way, but, you know, not like in a narcissistic way, but in that expansive sense of consciousness that and where we can transcend ourselves. You know, when it's OK to go beyond ourselves, a, a little side uh, story of that is, 
you know, I remember when I first started doing this work that started me out on this second half of life journey of mine, right? Um, I remember there was a day that when I had done so much work and, and it swapped out so many of those old feelings that I had a little bit of an identity crisis. I go, I'm not sure who I am. And I was kind of kvetching to the universe about this. And I, and I just felt this feeling of go through me. Let me get this thing straight, Garrett. You thought you were going to get totally different results with love and still be the same guy. Did I, <laughs> did I get that right? <laughs> right. And I'm like, okay, you got a point. <laughs> you do have you know, a point. That's, that's, that's freedom. And, to, and I didn't always know who I'd become, but I began to trust the process that this, the, the goodness of, of who I was, of, of the universe leading me. And, that, and, you know, so for me, that freedom is a place without fear and it's a place of expansion. You wrote the book, Safe to Love Again, How to Release the Pain of the Past Relationships and Create the Love You Deserve. Talk to me for a moment, Gary, about the main inspiration and intention of writing this book. You know, the main intention was I, I had degrees. I had been to what, over a decade of therapy. And what therapy had done me a lot of good. I had set in an intention since high school that I would not be divorced again, right? And after I did all that, I said, why didn't it, why, after all that work, because I, I did the work, right? Why didn't it work out better? And so uh, I, one day after a painful breakup, on which there was only one person really responsible, before that, the, the official story was, you know, women are too hard to love. But after this, this one was the one like, you know, when you look back, Gary, how, where's the one thread that's similar to all these relationships? And he was looking in the mirror, right? And uh, I, I said, you know, I worked on this. No one should work this hard to get the same results of just managing your pain rather than change it. And it became, a, and I said, then I, if they can't crack the code, then I will. It became a soul level, uh, you know, calling to, that no one should work this hard to really be able to love and have a lasting love um, and have it take this long and get those results. So that's what my life's work was born was noticing that I was in a groundhog day and what would get me out of the repeating pattern that really had been there since childhood. Yeah, I, that is a, a powerful message for all of us listening for myself and everyone listening that becoming aware of the patterns is so important that we are just repeating itself and that's what it does when we have unhealed wounds life seems to repeat itself all the time yeah and that's because in the book what i say is we get miss early on usually zero to three we get what i call missing rights uh, these feelings if we're you know we, we don't have a full right to reach out to have our needs met or a full right to create our own experience so we lose ourselves in relationship or a full right to speak up. And if you don't have a right, then you always do what you have the rights for, which I'll give, give, give and never take or I'll never speak my truth. These are the these Groundhog Day experiences are were once encoded as safe. At one time, it wasn't safe to reach out. At one set time, it wasn't safe to have a voice or to create your own experience. And when that on, so the brain keeps repeating that to survive, but the conscious brain says, this really sucks. And it's, so what I call these repeating cycles are just missing rights. Our brain wasn't given a full permission slip by early feelings of unwelcomed or unworthy or something or disempowered. And it's swapping out those feelings so our brain can do something other than repeat Groundhog Day. And knowing how the body, the brain works, right? Survival mechanisms. Well, if you think about it, Valeria, worthy people don't, don't marry takers. Uh, empowered people don't get dominated. <laughs> they, don't, they don't find people. You know, they, they have more rights for that. 
uh, if people feel unwelcomed, uh, unworthy, or disempowered, they're the ones that choose and create relationships. But once you swap out those early feelings so you feel truly welcomed and worthy and cherished and empowered, a brain will automatically choose better once it has the right feelings running under the base. Speaking of that, you are a transformational relationship mentor. Describe what it's like to work with you, Gary. What would that look like? Well, the so work I do once, you know, once I do uh, it's one-on-one work, and I and I'm it's kind of it's kind of like therapy, but not therapy. I'm not a therapist. I'm a, you know a relationship mentor. And what we do, it's deep work. My sessions are actually an hour and a half to two hours every other week because the brain needs time to integrate. Uh, What I do is I do things that what I call help neurons make better friends in your brain. But most of it is, you know, what I tell therapists who have asked me to start training them is I live and die with these four feelings. Between zero and three, your brain is given four key feelings. Were you welcomed into this life? Where you felt made to feel worthy to reach out to your needs? Did you feel cherished and protected? Meaning it's good to be a me in a we, not just me, not just we, but a me in a we. And did you feel empowered? If you have all those, you you opt for a pretty good love style. It's called secure. If not, if you get unwelcomed, unworthy, disempowered, or uncherished, you will either go anxious or avoidant. And it's and in restoring those feelings so it's safe to feel them again, cause it like with a borderline mother, you know, at four, if I spoke my truth and I was empowered, I would have been knocked up against a wall. It would not be safe to feel empowered, right? So you've got to find the flavor of safety for each of these missing feelings and work with the brain on its own terms. And then when you can reflate you can restore the flavor of safety it needs to feel welcomed, worthy, cherished, and powered. Then you can, after that, with a few you know, skills, you know, this person can reclaim what I call an earned secure love style. You know, so they pick and choose and create real love, not you know, painful love, not groundhog day love. Uh, but it's working with the four feelings. There's some identity work. Too. And with couples, you've got to work with skills, and then there's stuff between them. If it's a couple that I work with, because it's split my practices, my big client is not so much either one, but the we that's between them. And you got to work on the we. Uh, that's a little different than my singles work. You get them ready for the we, but for couples, everything is about the we. Show me a couple without a we, and I'll show you a war. Talk to me for a moment about the attachment styles, or you call love style. Is there more than one? In the book, you talk about three, right? Three I styles about three. of love. There's four. There's four. There's a fourth okay. thing called disorganized that I, I only mention in the book because it gets more into clinical yeah. stuff. Yeah. And I aim yeah. this book at what I call normal middle class craziness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair you know, enough. The, the normal middle class craziness, the stuff yeah. that you and I have all, we, we would know. <laughs> Yeah, right, right, right. You know, some even even invited into our house as pets. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know? That's but cute. So the, there's, and we know that by the time a child is a year to a year and a half old, that they have a love style, that bargain invention will track the rest of their life. So the secure love style, or you could call it attachment style, um, is the more technical term for it. This 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 is when we feel really comfortable depending and being dependent on somebody. Okay, these babies will grow up uh, to naturally pick somebody, and they create a good we. They 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 are comfortable being in a we, and they they do a good job of getting their needs met and meeting someone else's and speaking their truth. They're secure. They, they're they good with being in a good relationship. They, they're they comfortable with depending and being dependent on somebody. Now, if a baby was given, or even later on, it, later experience does influence this, by the way, but the original template is set up, you know, zero to three. An anxious baby is one that's had attention, not their attention, not their attention, not their, and some part develops a fight response, says, dead gone, I'm going to nail this thing down. And it amps it up. And, and their biggest fear is when does love go away? So they're the ones that grow up 
They go, well, why didn't you text me? You, you took me 15 minutes to text me back. Do you still love me? Where were you last night? You know, uh, And they're always worried about when love goes away. They're anxious, preoccupied with past pain. And they do a pretty good job of eventually, <clears throat> you know, so anxious that they push people away. Then there's the avoidance. And the avoidance tone down uh, love. What they do is they were the ones that weren't given a lot of attention. They were a lot of ignored. In fact, an, an avoided baby will be playing by themselves. And people go, oh, what a mature little baby. But that baby is actually where mom isn't ever going to come over and help me. So I better be playing by myself. And they tone down their emotions and they, they become what's called dismissive. And their worst fear is depending or being dependent on another. They don't want to be in a we. If they are in a we, it feels like they're in the same room, but on a different planet. So usually, you know, about 50% of the population, at least at 20 or so, is in 20 to 40 is secure. 25% are anxious. 20% are uh, avoidant, another 5% called anxious avoidant. Um, that's And so you might just ask, how comfortable am I being in a we? Am I really comfortable? Am I afraid of being in one? Or mm -hmm. am I afraid of going of what, the we going away? And that'll mm -hmm. pretty much tell you where you're at. You mentioned earlier something that um, made a lot of sense to me, which is part of the four feelings that create lasting love in your book. I think you, you talked briefly about the cherished and protected. So the four feelings, all of them are welcomed with joy, worthy and nourished, cherished and protected, and then empowered with choice. Would you like to um, explore one of these feelings or all of them, Gary? Sure. You know, so for a lot of women, a lot of, you know, if uh, this shows up a little more often in a lot of people, but especially with women is, is, uh, is unworthy. Okay. Because women tend to naturally have a natural uh, bent towards nurturing because, you know, the whole maternal instinct thing. But when you don't feel worthy, you, you hear the words not enough. Right. And the, the thing is you give and give and give and give, or you can't take, okay? But you, there's two parts. Now, I remember one couple dealing with, she was a psychologist, he was a clinical psychologist, and, and he said to me, what do you do when your wife thinks she has no needs? Okay, that, you know, she was going to be the empowered woman that never needed a man. And there's a lot of truth in that. You don't want to need in that way. But but the whole point of a we is to have your needs met. And <clears throat> she didn't reach out much. And when he tried to give, she just wouldn't take. So it's the ability to reach out and, and in a good relationship, a right to have your needs met is I give, I give to you and you take, fully take it in. And then you give back to me just a little bit more. And then I receive that, take it in, and I give back to you just a little more. And this way, when taking and receiving just a little bit more, each the couple spirals up in giving. Otherwise, what you normally show us when people give, 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 yeah. you get the queen or king of resentment. That's another, it almost sounds like a law to me, <laughs> the law of giving and receiving, right? This and if people harmony. Don't it, they, a lot of times people can feel so unworthy they won't even sign up to do the deep work. That's when you know there's a real out of control missing right to have your needs met, right? Um, it's, and, and the thing is I, I try to tell everybody is you were born worthy. Somebody had to teach you not to be worthy, but there's nothing you can do to earn being worthy. You were born worthy. It's simply recovering the feeling. It's a birthright. Like, nobody asks, can I, is it okay for me to breathe? That's worthy is the same way. You were born to breathe. You were born to feel worthy. If you're breathing, then you have a right to feel worthy. I love that message. Thank you for saying that again, Gary. Yeah, beautifully said. You don't have to ask, right? Do I have the right to breathe? Right. Yeah, the breathing is taking in what you need. So your body knows it. Right? So, so then, true. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what a beautiful message to be reminded of to know it, to be reminded. Thank you for saying that. 
what is the biggest challenge that, or one of the biggest challenges couples face in relationships? Well, there's a bunch of them, but yeah. you know, we live in a very relationship unfriendly uh, uh, environment. But when a couple first comes to me, this is the typical thing. They have been observing each other and they know that the whole source of the misery between them is that other person. That's, you know, <laughs> you know, that and there's, I can see, I've been observing you for a long time and I can see <laughs> those character flaws in you. And oh yeah, and I see <laughs> yours too, right? And these yeah. are, they are, and they make the, pa the partner the problem. Yeah. Now there are missing mm. rights, each person like I talk about, has these missing rights, these missing feelings, and they actually chose their partner because it matched their missing rights. So what I do is I help partners see how they had a missing right that chose the other person for exactly that experience, and now how can they how can they say thank you for providing something that was survivable? And how could we choose better? And the monumental first move that starts to change a, a, a couple, and this is one of my special sauces, what I get, I invite them to stop making the partner the problem, but to make the pattern the problem. And now I ask them, what if you could become a team, a we, to notice and support each other when the pattern is in the room rather than the partner? If you can get them to be a team against the pattern versus a burden enemies against the, each partner, mm. you have the beginnings of a we. That's wonderful. Not very clear, Gary. I love that. It's refreshing. I never heard it that way. Yeah, it's the pattern. You know, that doesn't mean you have to do deep work to give each other, you know, but the pattern is the real culprit not the partner and because the moment you keep the pro the focus on the, each partner what do you got you've got defensiveness criticism you've got all sorts of things nobody likes to be the problem but if you can both say yeah there's that pattern just walked in the room again yeah yeah <laughs> well, yeah think about it well this yeah. is what we can do you yeah. know it feels a lot better now they're they're teammates you know now they're in the you know they're and you know now they can they can support each other against it looks like you know that what that looks like it says you know he, you know he could say looks like um fred fix it just showed up in this conversation give me a second <laughs> <laughs> right if we can give that pause right just um become aware of the patterns and then see what we can do about it and with that in mind what is um your vision or what is the your reference of a great, not perfect, I don't think um, anything's perfect, but yeah, a beautiful, peaceful relationship. What would that look like from your perspective? Well, yes, there's no, there's nothing called perfect. Right? Yeah, no. As I tell my son and anybody that I love, uh, you know, sometimes I've heard, well, my God, you write a book. Right. If I do, if I do something that's you know less than everything in which we're all living, I go, hey, I promised you secure. I never said perfect. <laughs> and secure is you try to give these four feelings. It really is these feelings. Do you make them feel welcomed? Do you feel welcome? Do you make them feel worthy? Do you feel worthy? Do you make them feel cherished? Do you feel cherished? Do you make them feel empowered? Do you feel? And when you don't. You make a repair. And it's not in, it's not one of these, well, I try, I had the best of intention, but it's like, you know, I blew it there. When I made that response there, I was a little preoccupied and I could understand where you didn't feel very worthy. I get it. And and what do you really need? It's giving feelings, and when you don't give the feelings, make an honest repair without any ifs, ands, buts. That's that's the essence of love. It's there's always repair. There's no relationship without repair. Are you giving and accepting? And for couples, it's giving, repair, and accepting. Oh, accepting. You know, sometimes when people get aggrieved and they're a little righteous about how long they've suffered, uh, they don't want to lose their their long suffering victimhood, right? So 
you've got to be, but if you can give and take the feelings and the repairs necessary to keep them up, uh, we'll be in a pretty good relationship. That sounds like being open, yeah, open to healing as a word that I use a lot on this podcast. At the work I do, I always use the word healing. So being open to healing, right? Or being open to live a uncomplicated life. I guess I would say peaceful, uncomplicated. Let me ask you one more question about um, online dating. That's for singles. What is your suggestion? Do you have guidelines and suggestions for those who engage in online dating, Gary? Yeah, I I really tried to. You know, I did a wrote the book for singles and couples, right? Uh, but the, where I focused on singles and this whole problem with online dating. Uh, you know, the big problem is these dating apps. They use an algorithm based on compatibility. You know, yeah. you're like, are you a Pilates girl? Or are you yeah, a... yes. I, we would never want to confuse this, right? <laughs> oh, my God. You know, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? that's true. And, 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 and do you like bungee cords? Yeah. Uh, jumping off bricks with bungee cords or rock climbing, right? <laughs> and the funny thing is, is these compatibility lists, Valeria, I mm. have never seeing them walk into a couple's as to why they want a divorce or they don't think it can work. Nobody says, we haven't bungee quoted off a bridge. <laughs> and I think that marriage is in a, that, no, no, it's never about that. So what it is is to know that that's just icing on the cake. And compatibility predicts almost nothing. There's research on that. But if you focus on the four feelings, now you have, you know, once you meet them, you have to get them in person. OK, I mean, you know, and it's a numbers game. There's going to be a fair amount of avoidance out there. But once you start going out, notice in those first two, three, four dates, the four feelings. How welcome do I feel? How worthy do I feel? Do I feel empowered? Do I feel uh, cherished? Go with your guts. What do you feel? It's, you know, the example I talk about is I had a client come in and, and she didn't feel ever very welcomed or uh, no, ever very worthy or cherished. That went back to childhood. And the first of the first session, she goes, oh, my God, uh, I just found Mr. Jackpot. I'm always interested in Mr. Jackpot before we've done any work. Oh, my God, Valeria, he was six foot two. And did you know he was a doctor? And he had even read Jerry <laughs> Catman's on the five lemma. Just, and, oh, my God, he did yoga. He did yoga. <laughs> I mean, what sort of jackpot gives you a man like that? Um, right? Right. Well, about three sessions later, mm -hmm. she walks in with this perturbed look on her face. Like, what's going on? She goes, yeah, yeah, he likes Pilates. He likes checking out all the other women. Oh. Not so worthy, not so cherished, right? right? right. So yeah. we do the work, and a couple months later, she's dating online, and she's got two. She's got a virtual replay of Mr. Jackpot. The only difference is he liked yoga versus Pilates, and and he was an attorney, okay? And then the other guy was had a good-paying job in IT, but he was about 20 pounds overweight, came in with a Hawaiian T-shirt versus an Armani suit, right? <laughs> and a little balding, and they went out. And he, she chose the one guy from IT with a Hawaiian shirt. I said, why? And what she said after we restored her feelings of worthy and cherished, she goes, I picked him because he made me feel like a queen. Now, queen was her way of saying, I'm now worthy and cherished, <laughs> right? Empowered, right? That's, she went with her feelings. And a, a lot of times we're going with these, we make it far more simple uh, complex, and you talked about simplicity. What tells a one year old baby's brain that you're loved? Tells you. And as you well know, it can't be that complex for a one to one and a half year old baby. Four feelings tell that young baby their love, or they either have to be anxious or avoidant. It will tell you welcomed, worthy, cherished, empowered. Yes, you have to have some physical chemistry. Of, you know, yes, there has to be attraction. And yes, there has to be some alignment, <clears throat> right? You can both, uh, but if you've got alignment and some physical chemistry and you've got these four feelings, <clears throat> you've got a pretty good one. And I will say one thing on the online world, there's a lot of avoidance online. It's a numbers game. 
Give yourself time. Don't take it personal. You're worthy. <clears throat> just because someone doesn't treat you worthy doesn't mean you're not. It means they don't get the message. And just you know, keep finding the person that makes you feel these four feelings and don't settle for anything less. And just know that the little compatibility list has zero predictive ability. What will predict lasting is do you have a we? Do you have the four feelings? Do you have some alignment? We are almost at the end. I do have a few more questions for you, the ending questions. Would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? Uh, to read a passage in my book? Well, you know, uh, I tell you what, uh, I always liked the way I started it, okay? Okay, uh, because I, I wrote this thing over and over again to get it right, right? And the book is, says, if you've ever felt afraid, to put your heart on the line again for love. Whether you're a scared, frustrated single or a hurt and disappointed partner, you've come to the right place. Love takes real risk. The trick for creating lasting love is to know how to release old hurts so you not only can feel safe to love again, but to create the sort of love you wanted in the first place. That's, I, and it is real risk. People say, well, I don't want to take that risk. It is risky, but not if you have the rights. Not if you have the feelings and you pick well based on that. The risk comes when you take a, when you make choices to create or pick a partner as a single based on old feelings. But when you're using the real feelings of love to guide you as your new GPS for love, as I put it, then the risk goes down substantially. And there's always risk. There's a, there's, you know, you could fall in love with somebody. There's no, there's no guarantee that I can, you know, that the woman I love could get hit by, you know, being in a bad accident or something. God forbid. There's no, there's no, the universe has none of those, you know, those things, you know, but I don't worry about when does love go away, right? You know, there's a certain random nuttiness to the world, but I believe nevertheless in the in the in the security and the sanctity of love and it's worth that risk but you can minimize <laughs> you know it doesn't have to be somebody walking away because you know you, you know they found somebody at pilates that they like them <laughs> right <laughs> you know uh with the four feelings uh you can guide your heart to the home port that you and someone's heart that you deserve in a way creating the safety within and expanding that to the outside, right, Gary? So two more questions for you, the ending questions. What is another word for love? Mm, another word for love for me is, I think, honor and, and I like cherish. I do, I like cherish. Uh, yeah, cherish, you know, cherish comes from the word, you know, like, like to see the gift, mm, right? It's, it's yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a beautiful word, right? It just reminded me of that again, too. And the last question is, what are three things about life you know for sure as of this moment? Okay, the things I know about life that I know for sure is, you know, the one that I've always lived with is there's no unresourceful people, just unresourceful states. So no matter what you're experiencing, you are not the experience. You can be above the experience. You are above it. There's an I that's more than the experience, you know. And I also believe in the power of a we. Uh, I think, you know, we have a right to live in a we. This whole thing about self-actualization being the highest thing, no. We were born for uh, self-actualization always takes part in a we. And and I also, and the other thing I really live by is, is and that's my favorite line in the book, uh, is no experience of person should ever be in control of your incarnation. And just because something happened in childhood or, you know, or later in life for a lot of women, say, you know, if someone got molested or something like that, or someone had a, you know, a, a, a brutal divorce, none, why give that? person or that event the power over your entire life release the past pain and you have a right to feel empowered to be and create the love you deserve so it's not allowing any event 
core person to be in control of your destiny. Mm, yes, a thousand times to that. And I love, love the second thing you know for sure about the power of we. That's a great title of a, of a new book, if you're writing one. <laughs> I am writing one. The new ones uh, at the moment working title is that the other one changed um, is uh, Safe to Stay in Love. And it's a lot about the micro, the little tiny moments that create a we or not. And most love is really lost in five or six five or six second increments where you just don't respond or that thing. You know, it's it's little moments. If you can track it's what I call managing the moment. It's mm. little moments create a we. I love your work. It resonates to me as highly spiritual though. And and it's scientific and it's very clear, but it's also vast and mysterious and um, beautiful. Thank you. Well, if you look at the first eight chapters, it's me doing attachment theory, a lot of science, a lot of heartfelt stories. But I really felt compelled to add chapter nine on, it's called the soundtrack and the soul lesson, that there is a, a spiritual dimension to this as well. And I actually had a beta reader say, what are you adding that in there? It doesn't go with all the science. Well, since when, you know, I mean, Pascal, who created calculus, said the heart has reasons, the mind knows nothing about. So I, I just, I, I think you have to have the best of your heart, your soul, and your brain. We can, there's, a, there's enough ruins, there's enough room for science and the art and soul of science. You're integrating them somehow, spirituality with science, which um, in the end, it's all one. Everything's connected. There's nothing that's disconnected. So before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Well, if you go to www.garysalyer.com, G-A-R-Y-S-A-L-Y-E-R.com, I have videos on there and you can reach out to me. And if you go to garysalyer.com forward slash love guide, love guide, uh, I have some free gifts. If, whether you're single who's not dating, a single who's dating, you can't find the one, or a couple, it's a little video series, five to six minute videos. You'll get them for about two weeks. And it's a good introduction uh, to my work. And they're, they're meant to be just little inspirational things. I give some skills. People, I've had, I had one couple tell me it's the reason their marriage, uh, their engagement uh, uh, wasn't terminated, that that's, and that's how they stayed uh, and got to marriage, was by listening to this love guide. So either one, there's Gary Sawyer, or you go to love guide, and there's a free gift. Wonderful. I'll have the link on your podcast profile, too. Thank you so much again, Gary. And we'll talk soon. Bye Thank for you. now. It's been an honor. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Dr. Gary D. Salier and his work, please visit GarySalier.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.